Welcome to our ComposeCast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing all right over here. How are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine. I, I had a, a, a firmware update to my keyboard. It's, it's one of those ones where I can flash it uh, myself, and I'm actually, I'm actually designing which keys go where. So I shifted a, a, a couple of things around. What I'm really happy with now is now uh, instead of having to reach uh, all the way to the, the extremities of the keyboard for like the, the tilde key, or the, the tick key on the left, uh, as well as the right, the dash or the underscore key. I put those right underneath where the typical uh, N and M keys are. Uh, and so I have an extra row down there. So now whenever I need to do like an underscore when I'm naming literally any of my variables or uh, when I'm doing a tick to write a markdown and, and put a code snippet in there, they're right at my thumbs. I don't have to really, you know, kill kill my kill my pinkies to grab something up top there. And it's it's really, really cool. Just the amount of tweakability that I can I can do with these that things. That you have there yeah. now. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. I was gonna say, so do you have uh do you have to use like a special character with that to use those? Or did you just put them right underneath? I just put them uh, right underneath. Previously, I had my alt key right underneath, uh, right right at the at that same button on my left hand. So I just shift that over one. So now instead of control alt L to lock my keyboard, I end up putting in a back tick all of the time. So I gotta I gotta retrain my brain to to lock my my computer a different way. But other than that, yeah, it's 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 pretty fun. Just the amount of tweakability that I got with that. That's awesome. That's something else. <laughs> I need to I need to get something other than my laptop. I know we've talked a few times, I don't know, on screen or off about the laptop upgrade I'm due for. So looking at the X1 Carbons, just got to find something to use there. I mean, that's what I did. Keep an eye on eBay. I mean, the the battery life is the only thing that's really going to suffer. I think I got a 6th gen. Um, and, and obviously it's used, so it's, it's not going to have a brand new battery. Uh, that's something I could get replaced if I want to. I'm just never not near an outlet. And plus it charges using USB-C. So since that's something I always have on hand, there's no reason for me you know, to worry. The only thing is if I start playing like Civ or something, it just drains my battery like that. So jumping into the news here to, to kind of uh, not keep this all about myself, but uh, I wanted to to go through and talk about what we had. Uh, I brought I brought back the... Python is not pseudocode section. Uh, and Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> I was actually looking at these, and some of these, uh, I think it's just, it doesn't even have to be uh, anti-patterns for Python. It's So the news article we got here is common anti-patterns in Python, but I swear you can use it for any language. Yeah, like, like number three I thought was really good, an unnecessary use of generators. Uh, this just comes when you're like developing something and you start to build up a data set in your head and, and you're trying to manipulate it somehow and, and you're starting to think of it from the inside out. You start building the data structures and then it just gets progressively more and more complex, but you still leave the, the artifacts of, of your progress through your, your logic in there. And you're like, wait a second, I could completely get rid of that. I, I There's no need for me to have that in there uh so it's just yeah and, and, and it's, this doesn't really give you ways to think about it but it does call out some of the things that uh could are, are, are easy traps to fall into or stuck out to me there uh because i know i've been guilty of this more than once is returning more than one object type in a function call oh my gosh many a times it's i'm trying to return json in one part and then i'm returning you know boolean in the other it's like oh man what am i doing now yeah yeah just just kind of standardizing that um and and there are some python specific things in this article i i definitely liked not using with to open files and and this is something that python had not solved uh in its early days, uh, this is something that came, I think, a little bit on in the 2.x release series, but they they added the with operation, uh, which does an automatic close of the file handler whenever you break out of the, the uh, with with block or with section uh, and it just makes it so much simpler to to utilize i don't have to remember to, to close the file handler it's like it's like almost the opposite of go where you have to spell out everything python just handles it for me and i'm like yeah that yeah, that's great that's awesome there was there was a a meme i saw recently and someone had answered the question on Quora, I believe it was, so it was a screenshot, but someone had answered the, the question, you know, what's what's a better programming language, C, C++, Python, or Java? 
Uh, and the answer went something along the lines of, well, if you're writing an operating system, write it in C. Uh, if you're writing a memory constrained or otherwise needs to be super efficient program, write it in C++, need to be, need to be speedy or efficient. Uh, if you just need to get it to market, write it in Python. Uh, and then if your boss tells you write it in Java or you're going to get fired, write it in Java and look for a new job. Good. <laughs> I was going to say they all have their different use cases. I like that Java one, though. <laughs> yeah. Not to, you know, take shots at Java or nothing. but So, obviously, um, I, this this also, this article was released back in 2019. I, I'm just, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's tons of really good stuff, actually, on the, the Python subreddit as I'm, I'm starting to troll it a little bit more frequently. Sure, there's a lot of showcases and a lot of just, just general cruft. Uh, but there's there's a lot of things that resurface, and I'm okay with with reposting stuff like this if it's if it's evergreen, if it's something that that we could all use reminding about every now and then. So I was really happy to see this be posted, uh, and I did cross post this to the Arkham Post subreddit. So if you're on there and saw that, you you were able to get a kind of sneak peek uh, of what got into the show today. Uh, so moving on, uh, I think I also cross posted the next article that I had in the in the intro and and this is this is not a shot at you jack because you're going to be doing the editing for this episode but there, there was a there was just a really good post i started following the the audio engineer in subreddit uh and it said if you can't get an sm7b to sound great dot 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 right it kind of clickbaity title but there were there were some really good tips on on how to make it sound good uh, you know, it could be because of any one of the following re reasons, you know, not applying quality EQ. The, the the last one there, it's not because of any of the following with with one bullet point there being that SM7B is a bad mic because it, it it's really not. Uh, so I'm sure someone had 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 gotten fed up with with a couple of, you know, posts. Yeah, posts about posts complain about the SM7B and Jack, I know you're you're really happy with it and I'll I'll tell you what it does make editing the the audio for me really easy. I I don't think you're going to see any any hindrances with I like that. it. It's hey, it's a lot easier than headphones, right? Oh yeah. Uh, all right, so let's get into the the actual news here. That was the intro, yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was the, the intro. intro. I, 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 I was just kind of I was just kind of spitballing. All right, the on topic news items that that were, were, were I found this week. Uh, I found a couple. Uh, the first one is that PagerDuty has published an intro to Rundeck and PagerDuty Jack. I believe you have a a source for your grab bag topic from them later on in this talk. Uh, but, but pager duty is a kind of universal it operations automation type of a, a company who tries to standardize that. And, and almost like what Salesforce did to CRMs pager duty is trying to do with different on-call rotations and, and service and support for, for it incident response. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And as we talked about previously, they had, uh, recently acquired Rundeck uh, as a as a company. PagerDuty is indeed the, the company that acquired Rundeck, and it looks like they are going full throttle into kind of introducing it into the community and and trying to to build some kind of momentum around it. So uh, I I link to an intro to Rundeck course. Uh, I haven't taken it because I'm I'm fairly fluent in it, but especially with, with what we've been talking about, uh, going, going through that and, uh, the different, the different challenges we've run up against. If there's, if, if you don't have a baseline, really, there's nothing to compare it to. So this is, this should be at least a, a good place to dip your toe in if you haven't yet. So if that's something you're, you're looking to do, that's, that's always a good place. Let's, let's go right to the, you know, right to the source, see what they have to say about it. I'm going to leave this next one for you. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. Absolutely. So Python uh, has a library package management software uh, called PIP. And uh, PIP is what handles all the updating and, and installation of Python libraries. It has recently dropped support for anything Python 2 as well as Python 3.5 and earlier. Uh, so this is in an attempt to be able to clear out a lot of the legacy code base uh, and, and kind of get rid of that cruft, all the old stuff that they were keeping for backwards compatibility, uh, they can now get rid of. So that's really good to hear from a project perspective. 
Uh, but flip it around, I was able to get a secondhand incident r- you know, related to that. One of my, one of my coworkers did say, I just went out to one of my servers and updated PIP and then it refused to work for me. I was like, well, that's what you get, you know? Uh, so, so they, they have hard, hard stopped supporting Python too. And, uh, so what now? I mean, really you could, you could choose to leave your, your PIP at, you know, older versions and, and see if that works, but, but updating it to the newest one, that's, that's not going to, to do it for you. So the the next news article here was that GitLab, uh, who has previously been valued at over $6 billion, was looking at like an IPO or, or, or a public listing uh, for, for the company. Um, the article I linked didn't have much in the way of news other than kind of general background and and valuation uh numbers uh, but i was wondering you know what what do you think of public companies especially especially in light of what has been going on in the market recently in regards to wall street bets and ah uh, man i don't know what to say on that one i don't GameStop. have a good answer for you <laughs> i don't i take a look at those companies out there that are private right now i guess the the biggest one I can think of, obviously, Stripe, the one of the more successful private companies that's out there, and they're doing they're getting along just fine. You know, they can generate a profit. They're doing well. I don't know how I feel about GitLab going public. I think it's fine. I think it's great, but I, it's kind of a. I feel like those IPOs are just a big money grab for kind of every all the investors involved, everyone at the company involved, which is fine there's a lot of market manipulation i don't know if you want to call it that i guess it's a quote-unquote free market but i'm absolutely fine with them staying private i've i've i i don't know i'm not all on board with them going public because i feel like six billion still isn't that it's a it's a big number but i don't feel like it's you know that great of a number i don't know i also don't like GitLab's revenue model i don't know if you've seen it it's it's quite insane i think it's 1200 a year per developer uh, it's like 90, 90, 99 a month per developer. And it's like, okay, how are, who's paying for this? Where is this money being generated from? So I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts on it? I definitely myself have a penchant for private companies. Uh, I think when you enter the public sphere, you're subject to a lot of different, a lot of different forces that you're not when you're, when you're private, your, your incentive structure changes significantly and it it leads you down a dark path as soon as you ipo i mean you you get a you get a more diverse shareholder crowd right you you get people who don't necessarily take care of the tech or 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 are interested in the the sphere or the the broader idea a, a lot of the things that uh, the companies the the cool companies nowadays are doing is is doing a lot to grow the pie, as it were, of of the market share. You know, they're they're able to increase the value that the community as a whole can bring to market. It it allows you know stuff like like we're doing to to come to market and broadens the ecosystem rather than trying to trying to grab everything you know and and succumb it to the tragedy of the commons right so it's not it's not this zero-sum game that some people may have in their mind may make it out to be in their mind and i think it's it's really easy to do that when you are solely focused on quarter over quarter and maintaining a profitable turnover and and that's not to you know knock the the profit incentive at all there's there's obviously going to be a profit incentive for any kind of company the problem is when you're not able to accept short-term losses for long-term gains when you're not able to 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 justify that to yourself or to the people that you're beholden to when the when the people that you're beholden to don't understand well this is this is kind of where the community is going and unfortunately it's going to take a couple of quarters for us to rev this up at that point it is faith right you got to look back and you got to say hey 
based on what they've said and what they've produced so far, you know, that that builds the foundation of the faith that I have that they will continue on a positive trajectory despite what may on paper look like a, a downturn, right? At that point, you and and you can you can forecast that. You can say, hey, you know what, guys, I think we're gonna take a year and really start grinding away at the stuff that isn't going to be immediately profitable and it may look kind of bad. If you do that in an in a public company, your stock is going to plummet. You can't you can't have that. You can't have that honesty. You know, people if they're not seeing a return quarter over quarter, they're going to jump ship. Uh, so what what are your options at that point? I mean, you can't do anything but but steamroll ahead. And that's where you get in the trap of not being agile. If you have if you have a, a money printing machine, if if you have something that's that's churning out revenue for you, you cannot afford to interrupt that at all. You know, you can't afford to change it or take time to if it's on shaky ground, you can't take the time to change it out and, and put it somewhere else. You need that thing to keep printing. You need that thing to keep going. Uh, or else, you know, that shaky ground is going to turn into, you know, shaky investors. Your funding's going to going to get pulled out from from underneath you as soon as you don't immediately turn that profit. And sure, obviously there there may be that incentive in the in the private sphere, in the private sector as well, but those are people that you can be a little bit more honest and upfront with you know those are the people who actually do believe in what you're doing they just they don't just believe in your your profit sheet so all that to say if gitlab goes public i'm not going to you know ipo shame them or whatever but it is going to be disappointing because i i really like private companies and i think the incentive structure is better aligned for public companies rather than private ones. Excuse me. The yeah, the the incentives are aligned better for private companies rather than public. Well, and 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 this is kind of coming from our discussion on uh, Bitcoin and talking about the white paper. Uh, and and recently bitcoincore.org has removed the Bitcoin white paper from their website. Now, this is the website behind the group that develops Bitcoin, like the, the Bitcoin. This is Bitcoin, Bitcoin. They develop Bitcoin and they do not want the white paper anywhere near the site. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than wanting. Uh, if you if you were able to, Jack, read the article, I don't know if you, you got around to that yet. Uh, so I read the github pull request and it read like a youtube comments page i was sitting there just having a field day reading all that <laughs> reading, reading the pr reading everything after oh my gosh i i, <laughs> I was loving it i was loving it i was absolutely loving it but yeah, i don't know if it was mentioned in what did i say about about the bitcoin community i mean there's some vitriol there they, they've they've got it, some it, some it strong held dumpster. opinion it was a dumpster fire in that in the uh pr uh, and then it was a bunch of people complaining, wait, this is already merged. I guess it was not reviewed, What, whatever. Besides the point, I think it was in the article. Uh, so obviously the article here is uh, that there was a copyright claim, I think it was. Uh, so let me let me go yeah, to go the ahead. Bitcoin. I have so Bitcoin to add. Yeah, so, so, so Bitcoin.org, uh, sp specifically Cobra, uh, posted – Boasted on the Bitcoin.org site blog. Uh, and the intro went, Yesterday, both Bitcoin.org and BitcoinCore.org received allegations of copyright infringement of the Bitcoin white paper by lawyers representing Craig Stephen Wright. Uh, in this letter, they claim Craig owns the copyright of the paper, the Bitcoin name, and the ownership of Bitcoin.org. They, they also claim he is Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin, and the original owner of Bitcoin.org. Uh, Bitcoin.org and BitcoinCore.org were both asked to take down the white paper. We believe these claims are without merit and refuse to do so. Unfortunately, exactly. without consulting us, Bitcoin Core developers scrambled to remove the Bitcoin white paper from BitcoinCore.org. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the change was already merged and they've... I, I don't know. It's just It seems like... They gotta put it... I think that you at would, that point they you would assume to that... Up there. 
you would assume that Bitcoin, as toted as the censorship resistant peer to peer digital cash protocol that is meant to take down giants, you know, kowtowing to a man who's already proven himself not just to be untrustworthy, but also explicitly not to be Satoshi Nakamoto and caught in an extraordinary lie proving that. Yet yeah, they, they, they bend the knee to this guy because he sick some lawyers on them. Like, what are they going to do when some actual adversaries outside of the community start attacking the project? Like, this I is... I was going to say. And, and I, I no, I this is not it. them. This is not them compromising Bitcoin, the protocol, in any way. But it is still frustrating to see that, look, this is... They really have no morals or principles here that you know, similar to the ones that Bitcoin was started with. So what are we, you know, what are we to expect of them going forward? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. So, so we're, yeah, they collapse like a paper house. I mean, I went down, th this was the comment I wanted to find. It was, uh, I am tut tut. <laughs> I am you tut tut. I am tut tut. That's the guy who commented. So they actually locked the conversation to, yeah. Just collaborators, which was fine. Absolutely fine with that. It really probably would have gotten out of hand quick if they kept it open. But the big comment here, now I should have researched further, but they have the copyright office doesn't vary the merits of a claim. It just registers it. So they took it down on a claim. Yeah. Allegations. Allegations. Oh. Bending at the knee, you're, you're literally – they just collapse almost. They're just oh well, and it's exactly like you say. It's exactly like you said. What are they gonna do when a real adversary outside of the community comes in and attacks them? And they're not gonna attack the Bitcoin protocol. I mean that thing's, you know, that thing's fairly bulletproof. They're gonna attack side channels. They're gonna attack, you know, the the developers. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're going to attack them personally. They're going to attack them professionally. They're going to, you know, come at them with it, it, all kinds of social angles. You know, uh, obviously the, the, the counterintelligence agencies of the world have been doing this for centuries, uh, if not longer. You know, they're, they're very, very good at this and, and, and they know exactly how to do it effectively. Obviously, the digital realm is new, but I have no doubt that they're going to be easily easily transitioning those methods to you to this you know and it it doesn't even necessarily have to be a nation state attacker but i mean those are the people who are going to have the the biggest the biggest advantage the biggest leg up if they wanted to right so how how can you even ex you know begin to expect this to happen and 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 this is also going back to to bitcoin cash too it's like there are several different companies developing the Bitcoin Cash protocol, right? There, there are several different groups of developers who are all coordinating. Whereas you had the Bitcoin Core implementation, which is you know the 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 BTC uh, mo under the BTC moniker, that is developing this this protocol in in almost a monolithic type of way and there's just no coordination with any other teams or or security researchers or, or, or anything else of, of 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 that kind of uh caliber of people so i i i see this as a central point of failure that they've artificially set up so this is this is frustrating on on many many different levels i'm sitting over here and i'm laughing because right now they're their own worst enemy they're shooting themselves in the foot i was i was uh surfing uh, before the show and I, I found does IPFS have a blockchain.com so if you want to let us know what's on that page it should give us some insight on the does IPFS have a blockchain.com no <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's good. That's good. So for anyone listening, <laughs> it's uh, HTTPS. Does IPFS have a blockchain.com? <laughs> and then and that will give you all of the information you will need on this page, as yeah, to the, the technical <laughs> implementation of IPFS's uh, 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 blockchain technology. Blockchain yeah, 
Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so definitely check that one out. Uh, we're not going to get into the details, <laughs> but it's out there if you want to go check it out. Um, a lot of information out there. Right now, for our Compose Developments, we're looking at mon- health monitoring within Docker, and we're looking at self-healing instances. And one of the things that Andrew and I have a big, I, I wouldn't even call it a fight on or what, differing opinions, I'll say, is polling versus webhooks. Yeah, now, basically know, something that works versus something that theoretically should work. It, fine. All right. I'll give you that one, right? I'll give you that one. It's so great in theory. It's, I, I love it. I'm here for it. It's, yeah, no, I mean, webhooks has a great does, value proposition. It, yeah. In theory, it's like, all right, I make one call out and it gives me one call back. But unfortunately, in practice, who would have guessed that's not the case? Stuff well, is not missed. only is it. Yeah, not only is it not the case, but it also takes a lot of engineering just kind of in general around the logic itself because you have to not only – Yeah, because not only that, but you also have to – anything that you need to retain throughout the rest of the logic has to be stored somewhere, right? So if you're – if you would otherwise just kind of keep something ephemerally in memory as you're going through the logic of something, right? As soon as you make that that API call and then terminate the program, you're going to have to store everything else that you were going to reference after the, the return. Right. Later. You're gonna, right. you, you have, yeah, you're, you have to pull, you, you have to pull back up and say, all right, this is where I came from. This is what I need, need to do. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that is either in one of two directions. The first is either you, you store it somewhere from you, well, you store it from the place where you're making the call out, um, right. and, and would subsequently receive the webhook API, or you pass all the information when you make the call so that the webhook can pass it all back on the other side. So, like, this isn't a problem when you're talking about, you know, what domain are you coming from? Like, that's a, that's a really easy one to solve. It's actually probably going to be on both sides, right? But what about, you know, secret management or what about uh, 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 run IDs or any, right. yeah, any state. kind of state? state. Yeah. Any right. kind of state is going to have to get saved. So, like, where, where are you going to save that state? Are you going to be passing it? from program to program and if you're going to do that can you guarantee the uh the the security and the not obfuscation but like you 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 need to make sure to not leak details about stuff that you don't need to be leaking right or or you also have to worry about uniformity am i going to get back in the right kind of setup you know is it is it always going to come back unchanged do i have to you know what happens if it doesn't come back right then you have to build in a whole bunch of resiliency to your application to say all right not only do i have to worry about what if this comes back with an error what if it doesn't come back at all at all right 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 and, and there's I'm just, definitely times where i have seen that there's definitely I'm just, times where i'm like oh crap oh man yeah and they're going where to go and it's like oh i posted somewhere it's like well where did you, you know where'd you make the post request to for this webhook it's like oh out, out in the middle of nowhere at this domain that doesn't exist i'm sitting there like why why did i why have i done this to myself <laughs> well and then that makes it impossible to test too because when you it makes so, it hard, so it makes it very difficult to test I'll when totally you were when you were testing um i actually i think you might have ran into that because something i had to change in your code last night was that when you're popping stuff off the stack you were getting the second job ID, like the, the yeah. second to last job ID Literally, instead yeah. of the very last job ID. So like when I ran a job and wanted to report on it, I couldn't report on it because it was reporting on the second to last the la- one the second instead yeah, of yeah, the yeah. last one. Yeah. And I'm going in here like, what, what, what's going on here? Did because you like the last, the last, so that that's a weird the one. The last just... one might not exist. Well, yeah. No, right, so you right, have right. to right. build more <laughs> logic around it to say. <laughs> around the state uh, going, where is this? What is yeah. this? Yeah. I don't know why I have such such an anti I it's just the continuous while loop I just don't know what I have against it I'm well just stuck there you going, did you know why am I running an infinite loop here I feel like this is a just kind of a danger especially for calls that are happening more than one you know happening on a cron job every 10 minutes well and it's not like you didn't bring up a valid point about the network either right um that that's my other case that goes all right well what happens when we make you know, right now we're making it from probably six instances back to one home server. What happens when it's 10? All right, fine. Every 10 minutes, we just keep polling, you know, maybe 10 times every minute, you know, once every six seconds or six times every minute, once every 10 seconds. But 
that network does start to add up is what I'm looking at. I mean, obviously right now it's not a problem, but I think if you ask me why web hooks, I think it's just, it looks great. It's one of those things that looks great on paper. It absolutely looks great. It's like, Oh, this is going to work. This is going to work. It's going to, I'm going to call out and it's going to make a call back to me and it's going to say when it's done. And then I can process the logic from there in practice. Not so much the case a little bit. Like you said, you're running into literally just playing logic games with yourself. So kind of what we're running into, uh, kind of what I have run into. Um, but we're fixing it. We're fixing it. We're getting health checks working. Um, well, and it, working here. especially when you're head down in your code for so long too. I mean, you, you, it, oh, it, yeah. having, having not been able to come up for air for, you know, a couple of weeks or whatever, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to give you a little reprieve to, Take to jump look, in yeah. there and say, you know, well, let's, let's clear away some of this old cruft. Remember we're there's building lot, stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, let's see if we can't. But, you know, and that's, you know, I was preaching code review a couple episodes ago and I'll preach it again. I mean, that's, that's the only way you're really going to be able to, to clear out some of that stuff. I mean, you're, I hold on to code like a newborn baby. I mean, I, I do not let that thing go unless someone's able to come here and say, well, you know what? That's a, it's easy. It's actually get, a turn it, up, it, it, but you know, one of those things, it's that thing. It's, it's very easy to get, uh, what it attached to your own emotionally. Code. Yeah. yeah emotionally emotionally attached. attached. Yeah. Like when I saw you put comments in the other time about, uh, I think it was the first 1280, 1288. I was like, Oh man, he doesn't like it. <laughs> and I was like, I was looking at him like, yeah, neither do I. So I'm glad, he's, you know, I'm like, I just cleared all the comments. I was like, oh, well, this is, this isn't great. So I'm glad he did say something about it. <laughs> Looked at it with a second breath. And I was like, yeah, this is just, this is just dumb, <laughs> but so <laughs> it's very easy to get, what mentally it's you know just attached to the code so i don't know it's code if i you put some creative thought into it absolutely but there's no sense in getting upset over you know code review and the benefits and, and, of it and there's been a meme going around it's like you know there's there's uh I, I, it was it was some kind of popular twitter post someone said uh, you know the best way to learn language is to you know uh put on a children's video version of it because you know children's videos kind of uh, dumb down the, the the language whether you're learning like russian or french or something they'll say it really slowly and and make sure to enunciate and and give you visual clues along with the the language and stuff like that uh and then someone's like uh there's no one who actually natively speaks java you know so <laughs> there's no there's no children's videos in java <laughs> Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> and and so as you're writing this, uh, sure, it is an actual language and sure it is something you are picking up and able to express yourself in. But when after after having picked up the language, and this is actually interesting too. So after having picked up the language, the actual parts of the brain that are triggered as you're writing code are more akin to problem solving and and almost spatial recognition and, and awareness than than the language centers of the brain so like what's actually being activated is more so the the problem solving aspect yeah and how things can fit together and and holding different different uh ideas in your head at the same time and and getting them to to fit together so it's it's a lot more than an actual language and and you really are kind of crafting something from the ground up you have to take a sec you have to take a look back and go all right well this wasn't the way i should have done this it should have been done a different way yeah there there are a couple of things here in dev uh that i could i could pull out um like uh covering the the jekyll test uh for the servers running um, stuff, but I think I think more so uh, it was it was good today to focus on that as as well as like what I've been what I've been doing too is I've been I've been pulling Jack along, kicking and screaming here, but making sure that his eyes are on what I'm doing as well. Like there were there was yeah. a there was a time I think it was uh, our last Sunday meeting when you're like uh, there were like to dos left over in the code. Oh yeah, yep. I was looking at yep, 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 yep. You're and. Not 
explain that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I hadn't caught that. So I, you know, wanted to make sure, you know, everything had been caught, you know, just, just getting that second pair of eyes um, is, it's always going to be beneficial. You know, even though Jack's forte isn't exactly Ansible, mine's not exactly Ruby. We're both fluent enough to, to catch, understand it, yeah. to read it. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess uh, we'll just, I mean, anything, anything more on that, Jack? I know. Uh, I, no. yeah, I know you've been busy no. with, with getting that, so hopefully we can we can pull that one, dragging, yeah, sc- sc- drag, kicking and screaming, production. yeah, into production across the finish line, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a matter of looking at it a different way. And I think I'd been looking at it the wrong way the entire time since I started. I was like, all right, well, I wanted I wanted to do this and this, and I was storing state in a database because I was going to refer back to it, but it's not what do they call it? Functions as a service. We're not running it as a standalone api it's its own it, it can sit there and ram it's, it's an not app, stateless you know, it's running oh, yeah, on its own we, right right it's not state right yeah it's running stateless stateless would be you know is it is great for you know apis and webhooks because you know if you if you standardize everything to be able to accept everything that you needed to and spit back out everything that you needed to without revealing secrets that it and shouldn't be not, right. then you're fine right you know but we're not it's not that. It's not, We're not that. Not near right. that level right. of sophistication. Right. No, right. Right. no, no, no. Um, but not a not a bad goal to aim at. It's something to keep in mind. What do you have for us this week in the uh, integration discussion? You want to kind of dive in here and check it out. So we so we have another one for Camboard. I don't know. Is, is this our last one? Do we have um, a few more here? I think we have users and groups and um, maybe. Do we have analytics left? We're definitely wrapping up. Uh, I, I would like to touch on analytics. I don't know if user management necessarily needs to be addressed. It's it's fairly straightforward. Uh, I also have troubleshooting here. So maybe okay. we could put together something on that. Although I believe that would be something we would probably learn more so as we go through and, and document different fixes and stuff. Um, I, I, I think this is at least going to be uh, the... The beginning of the end of of what we need to touch on uh, for cam board here so we're definitely definitely coming to a close and this is going to start to overlap into stuff that we've already previously discussed so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say i i need to keep to something strict but this is this is going to be referencing a lot of the the stuff that we've already gone through so uh, let's just dive in here by board customization what i would like to go over is how do we use our boards a little bit more eloquently uh, a little bit more accurately how do how do we tweak them and tune them so that they're useful for us there is a lot i could go over here i pulled out what i thought would be beneficial and we can obviously jack between between the two of us go into if something else makes sense to to touch on or, or put into this but I, I, I believe I captured everything that I, I wanted to here. So I wanted to start off with uh, custom filters. Custom filters are searches that you can share among the team. They look just like regular filters that you can share with the rest of the board. Last episode or two episodes ago, we were talking about the search filter of Camboard and how to search by assignee, how to search by due date, various other things there is and i don't believe we went over this but on the board next to the search bar itself there is a drop down which has predefined filters to apply for instance uh, my tasks my tasks due tomorrow not assigned assigned no category etc etc so those are all predefined filters that you can apply and, and, and have it run to find tests that you're looking for. If there are filters that you find yourself using over and over, for instance, we every other week look for tasks that are not complexitized. Those, those types of searches would be good to put into custom filters because you can have a similar type drop down. I think it's like two buttons over, which uh, will give you, or actually the next button over, excuse me, which would give you the custom filter. So you can, you can start searching through the tasks as you go through them. Now, one of the things I did, the first thing I did is uh, in the 
integration session uh, that I recorded that's been posted up on YouTube. I went over some of the Camboard plugins in a little bit more depth than we went over in the podcast episode and was talking about the group assignment plugin and how that required a specific search term to look at all of the tasks that had the assignee either as your own self or that you were listed as one of the other assignees to the tasks. And the actual keyword for that is all assignees. Um, now, if you look at the predefined filter, the predefined filter will have just assignee as a filter. So it actually won't catch those other tasks that the plugin allows us to categorize as. So one of the custom filters that I created was a my assigned tasks filter that popped up the all assignees tag so that it would in fact include all of the tasks that I would be concerned about. And now I have that as a convenient drop down right there for me and as does Jack. And since I filtered it on the currently logged in user, while Jack is the logged in user on his end, when he runs that filter, he's going to show all of his tasks. When I run it, I'm going to show all of my tasks. So that makes it easier for us to to kind of share these filters that we would use on a common basis. Uh, for instance, we have a I, I I broke them down under the categories or the excuse me the tags that we, that we have. have. Yeah. So the the content marketing tests, the resiliency tracking user information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have those, and and I believe we'll continue to to build on it. And uh, like the the complexity one, I think is is one that we're going to be putting in there to make sure that him and I can level set on the the kinds of filters that we're, we're going through when we're taking a look at these tasks. Um, the next thing here uh, in, in customizing your board is predefined content. And Jack, I, th I think we talked about the way that we structured the tasks uh, and, and, and made sure we had different different fields to fill out and, and parameters that we wanted to see in the task description. So if you could refresh everyone on those, we'll kind of dive in how to do that on a larger scale. Yeah, so you're talking about the uh, why, how, and... Done. Why, done, and how. Uh, so what's that? Basically, essentially, we want to know why we're doing this task, you know, what it is when it's complete, and then how we're going to complete this task. I, I usually think of what context are we in, and what is it? the big thing is when is this task completed? So what we're able to do with predefined content is front load some of that into the description of the, the tasks as we create them. Obviously, those three details are not fields that Canboard gives to us. Like that's that's not we like a field that, that we would would fill in. Yeah, that's that's something that that we kind of free form and and put in ourselves. Uh, predefined content allows us to have a drop down under the new task and that we're able to select that selection will pre-populate both the task title as well as the task description and give us those fields so for instance we're able to auto populate the why done and how prompts and and literally they're just you know words with a colon after them so that we remember, we remind ourselves, hey, I need to define all three of these things when I'm creating this task. And that dropdown will, will automatically put those in for us and we can just continue filling out the task as normal. Uh, so that's a, that's a good heads up. It is fairly limited. I think the only thing it allows for is the task title and the predefined contents. I would love if it included stuff like complexity and, uh, assignee and, and, and stuff like that. But uh, as a as a base implementation, it's it's perfectly it's a, fine for, for yeah. that scenario. Yeah. Those those predefined uh, contents there. Can you explain how to use those? Because honestly, I've created tasks. Is that something I have to generate? I have to generate it with that using that. So do I have to go to predefined content and say, hey, I'm going to use this task? Or is there a way to. So I, and I'll, I'll when walk creating a new task. I will I will walk through this in our integration session video that we post up to YouTube. Uh, but basically, whenever you're creating a new task, there's going to be a drop down right below the task description field, which you can select any one of the predefined contents 
that you specify inside of the project configuration. So you can have five, six, seven predefined contact, you know, what, whatever Out makes there, sense yeah. for what, for what you're doing. Uh, the one we have is going to be selectable whenever you create a new task right below the project description field. And it's just going to be uh, titled why slash done slash how like it's, it's just the, as the, the as that. Yeah, the description that we, we have given it there. Uh, and I said that the title will be the name of the predefined content, and it is available underneath the description of any new task. Next, I wanted to touch on how boards are represented in the dashboard. And I'm sure for the last couple of episodes, I've, I've touched on the dashboard being the most important part of the workflow it being the first thing that you see when you go to your page and all of your open tasks and yada, yada, yada. But I don't think I've touched on how to limit what's actually shown on there. So the, the easiest way to do that is by limiting the columns that are actually shown on there. Obviously, since this is a CAM board system, a lot of the states are represented as columns. So if we consider a workflow to be left to right, I'm probably only going to be able to work on tasks that are in one, maybe two different columns. So it would be worthless if I had every, every column Everything represented. Open, right? Yeah, all the tasks in every column represented on my front page dashboard. So unfortunately, it's not on a dashboard level but it's in a project by project level where you're going to specify which columns are visible on the dashboard so we would go to the the configuration here you know it, it, in in any given project and and select which of our columns are visible on the dashboard. Obviously, this is the same place you would go when you are creating a column or deleting a column, uh, but that would just be the extra step to specify whether you want those to be visible on your dashboard or not. I think by default, when you're creating these, it comes with th a three column system, a to do, doing, and done. And doing is the only one that is visible on the dashboard by default. Uh, and then any other columns that are created will, I'm not sure what the default is, uh, but it is selectable at the time that you create the column. Okay. Yeah. It's nice to know that your dashboard, I don't know if you configured this or not. I see it highlighted in red. So I assume it's configured that it's visible on the dashboard and you only have in progress listed. That's, that's correct, a great yeah. way. That's a e very easy way to see everything in essentially in progress for you versus Hey, by the way, here's every single one of your tasks that's out there, which like you said, it's kind of useless. It's, it's too much. It's almost uh information overload. Well, and, and, you know, we haven't exactly had the conversation, but it might be worth having the review column visible as out well, there, because right, if, right. if something's in the review column, it's something I need to review. That means you need to take a look at, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that may be worth taking a look at as well. Once again, depends on the specific implementation of, you know, what's a workflow, what can be done, what is best next. And I think that's just, you know, if, yeah. if you start there, you're going to end up at a good place. So, so if you start thinking what's best next, well, what's best next is not what's in the backlog. So we can, we can immediately rule that out uh, and then just follow that logic to its, its logical conclusion. The last thing I have in the notes here is sorting the tasks in the dashboard. Now there is a drop down sort for most of the sections in the dashboard. And that sorts it by default by priority. This is also another reason why I say the 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 swim lanes that you set up should ha be correlating should correlate to the priority that you have in some form or fashion meaning that the higher priority however however you define that is going to be on top i just you know i don't i don't know what that means for all specific boards I'm, I'm not even sure if there is any kind of universal but i'm saying if you have different swim lanes on your board make sure the top is what's important you know whether it's uh, different sections of your job, the top should be like the, the business unit because that's that's the thing that actually gets you money, right? right. So, 
there is there is a default that Camboard gives that default sorts it to priority. And I I typically do end up sorting uh, either by due date um, or by category if I want to see those grouped together. The problem with that, though, is that it it relies on a, on a URL parameter to actually take effect. So it, it will survive a page refresh, but, and, and it also might be a good thing to bookmark. If you want a different default sort, you can bookmark the URL with all of the parameters, and that will give you the, the sort that you're looking for by default if you want something other than priority. But if you, but barring one of those two approaches, you will always be greeted with priority by default. Um, and I think that's that's really all I wanted to go through. That's all I had to go through. Okay. Uh, I know there's there's a lot we can talk about, and I I don't I didn't know if I wanted this to devolve into you know what a board setup should look like. You know what are some common board setups and and stuff like that. But I think I think what I wanted to do is is applicable to any type of board setup what would be the things that you would want to tweak in order to have a better you know, first five second view of your board like your first oh, like what do you want to call that like where you a snapshot like a quick i don't know overview quick at yeah I overview mean, yeah 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 like what is your what is your initial like i think it's a one... snapshot snapshot of the board just where what's everything what's going on with it a snapshot is good, but a snapshot implies that I'll be sitting down to kind of analyze it. Like I'm, I'm talking about something where I just, I pull it up on my screen and what I got in front of me is what I got in front of me. And it better be worth me looking at it. Like it, it, it better convey exactly what I need. Quick it to. Over, like a quick over. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, quick overview, honestly. Yeah. That's, I, I, how, how do mind. I get that? How do I get that valuable overview? You know, how, how do I say this is, this is valuable to know that this is like, I have, I have three things right here on my dashboard. Like that's, that's it of all the tasks I got, uh, in, in, in flight here between, uh, reviewing and getting ready to do and, and waiting on and stuff. The three things that are right in front of my face here, um, include like the, the podcast reporting is, is uh, the podcast recording is one of them right here that's that's important because that's what we're doing right now that was coming up all day i needed to know that that was something that was going on so um and then i you know i look at my board and by default i actually have this the open status of of our board so i i just take a look at everything and then i start to filter down and we talked about collapsing columns on a on a previous yeah, uh, task, but you you start to filter it, especially for the the ta the test between you and me. You know, having having two people on our on our board, right? I I filter it down to only my assigned tasks, and it makes it that much easier, right? Or easier to look at, right? If off. I'm if I'm in a mood to just kind of code, I know a lot of the resiliency tasks that we're doing are code heavy. Right. And not, not a lot of creating content and stuff like that. I can just sit down in front of a terminal and just kind of bash something out. No pun intended. So I pull up the, the, uh, the resiliency tasks and, uh, well, it turns out I don't have any right now cause I did them all cause I didn't want to create any more content. <laughs> but if, you know, if I, if I wanted to, they would be there. So uh, stuff like that is, is going to make me more efficient navigating this board and it's it's going to make this board work for me and and do for me what it needs to which is focus my effort into what's best next oh i guess i'll touch on why i named the show neapolitan board uh, but no i was i was thinking more about the board views themselves and you know what what do we see when we log in what's our what's our overview our our snapshot i gotta come up with a better term for that but you know what's our what's our split second reactional overview to that and how do we move that from a vanilla setting to, to a, a ah, neapolitan okay 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 all right so like it. 
indicating that you know we're not doing a whole bunch here we're not you know customizing on css or or anything here but we're 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 you know just putting some chocolate and strawberry uh, around the edges to, to make it that much better so the uh not quite the icing on the cake that that would be a different analogy so what i hear is that you are all fueled up and ready to talk to us about chat up i'm actually really excited so i picked chat ups only because last week, <laughs> instead of doing anything productive, I was thinking about how I go from writing code on my local machine to getting an image to deploying it on a dev instance or an instance. And since we had just talked about uh, moving our, not moving, changing our Git workflow from uh, tagging dev and then pushing dev to, hey, why don't we do feature branches? I said to myself, oh my gosh, if I have to sit here and create a branch within my project, within our environment, within, you know, possibly even the role or the uh, playbook branches or within repos, I'm like, that's four repos I'm touching on top of logging into run deck and doing whatever I need to do in there, you know, create environment, run, deploy. I, I, there's so many things I'm touching at this point. You know, I have to log into my Bitwarden uh, instance and then I have to log into our compositional enterprises Bitwarden. And so I said, this is, I said to myself, this is way too, like, there's a much easier way to do this. I, I, let me just grab some API tokens that'll last, you know, 45 days or whatever, get something out there that I can deploy an instance as myself very easily from a branch I know how to define and I can do this all from one, 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 one spot here. All right. <laughs> this is where I get into chat ops. I decided that <laughs> matrix <laughs> was the one spot <laughs> where everything is going to funnel through. There is no sense in me creating one more freaking web app <laughs> to log into and use. So I said, uh, all right, let me spin up chat ops. Let me get something on the, on the books here, get something working. Um, so I created like, it was actually really quick. I should have made it. We should have created a, I, I, what I need to do is I need to create a library for, um, everything that we have for, you know, run compositional role, create environment, um, from Ruby because across now a few projects, we have essentially a library of methods and wrappers and they're managed separately across, you know, now this chat ops application that I strung together. Uh, portal and command center and they're out there and I was looking and I go oh you know one more thing to manage but that's kind of a subject for another time um anyway I got chat ups up and running and so now essentially instead of going to a million different spots I can log into matrix and say I'll be specific here I want to have all GitLab pipelines when they complete send a note to the matrix chat room saying that our new brand, a new feature branch is built. Well, that's that's not even the bots doing. That's that's just what GitLab is is able it's to to web, call. Pushing, yeah. pushing a webhook saying it, it, it's it's not I'm, not I'm not even going to get a webhook. So I'm going to take back I'm going to cut that entire statement out. It's <laughs> GitLab makes a curl post request with a variable that you can define in, you know, you can keep secrets in GitLab to our matrix chat room for alerts. And it says, Hey, a new feature branch has been pushed. So anytime a feature branch isn't pushed now in our matrix chat room, I'm going to get the alert saying, Hey, you know, portal branch X has been pushed 1288 a you'll have to take, a, you'll have to take a look at, <laughs> You'll have to take a look at oh, okay. the, la the last line they of CICD. Pushed. They have yeah, pushed. It's part, yeah, it's okay. part of a CICD. Okay. You're it's right, part of right. continuous integration, continuous deployment. No, but anyway, I said I wanted all this stuff in one spot, and I wanted a matrix. I've already said this a thousand times, but the workflow now for me is essentially in one location. I develop on my local machine. I go over to matrix on my local machine. I can essentially do everything from now to applications instead of context switching between, you know, four or five websites. And I don't know about you, but it's very easy to get distracted. You know, it's very easy to get distracted when context switching four different spots, five different spots. 
to find all these things. And, you know, at, at the end of all this context switching, I'm, whoa, you know, it's almost, it's not yak shaving, but it's a, what, what did I come here to do again? It's like, oh, wait, I got to text, you know, test my instance. And one command is a lot easier to issue than 15. Now it comes at the cost of complexity, but as you were just talking about, like creating a library of these kind of functions, this is already something we have set up in command center. Like right. command center can already create an environment and deploy an instance and deploy it. Right. It's so we there. already have a framework to, well, not a framework. We haven't, we haven't instance that does that. Um, but right. now we need to create it and make it into a framework. I think that's really what the main tangent I want to main topic. I want to talk on was just all the context switching mm. that kind of goes on and just the distractions that do, do kind of happen and take place. I just kind of said, all right, I want, one place to log in and i want to be able to kind of see almost this entire life cycle yeah i mean development's not sexy like it, it's 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 really no. not um and and a lot of the things that you develop locally aren't going to work in the field and like we were talking about previously i mean it's really hard to test webhooks and api calls you know if you don't have the entirety of the development infrastructure stood up in a separate environment in a local, right right Either local or otherwise. I mean, it's it's very difficult to, to make sure that you have the ability to test in production that you do in prod. And then as you're developing, you know, how, how do you go about doing that? What's your workflow? And I've been thinking about, you know, how do how would we enable our Compose to be a developer friendly? You know, how, how would you develop against it? How would you develop it? as a platform you know how would you use right. it to to produce an app like could could is that something you could do and and there's different things i think that would need to be implemented but from the position that we're at we kind of have a, a little bit more accessibility into what we need to 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 be able to do the things to develop it um but yeah there is that there is definitely that wait time because it needs to have an image to deploy and you need to go ahead and deploy it uh, and, you know, developing against that is, is always going to require some kind of build and deploy time. And yeah, how, how do you, how do you minimize that? How do you lower that? How do you, how do you make it a little bit more friendly? Friendly. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's what it is. That's less context switching and quote unquote more friendly. This time it ended up being through chat ops. I mean, like what, what would we use chat ups for? Like to, to get into, to, to get into a more, I mean, maybe you want to go over chat ups first, but like all the things that we could and should use chat ups for. So I, and why chat ups? Sure. Sure. So I go, we go all the way down the list. So uh, yeah. the first thing I think of is uh, building images. Like you said, that, that's a huge, that's, I think. Because one of and, the most and, important, more than one of the more important ones. Cause it, at least it lets me, it says, you know, Hey, by the way, the cookies are done. The image is complete. You can deploy this thing now and test it on a server, right? The very first thing I think about is the the XKCD of the two guys like standing on office rolling chairs, like fencing, right? With like paper towels or something like that. And their boss comes up. He's like, what are you doing? And they're like, we're waiting for well, our wait. code to compile. <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, yep. okay. <laughs> he walks away. Yep. Like that's that's literally what we're doing after we're, 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 we're building yeah. these. We're, you know. I mean, we should be pushing Reddit content, but you know, who am I to say anything like that? What we want to have, though, is we want to have some kind of ping, some kind of alert that you know when that's done, so I don't have necessarily have to babysit the thing and, and check and, right. uh, until it's done. Not only that, but also if we're collaborating, right, or even in that using that XKCD reference, if the boss is in the chat too, right, he can see when the image is built, so he can see if they're still fencing at that point. They they really need to, you know, you need to corral the troops here. But for for me and you, I mean, when we're we're working together, that's a good line of sight where we can keep on the same page about things, especially, um, you know, and and we might even start to expand this and and say, you know image blank is building like before it kicks off so that right. I don't try to kick off a concurrent to, build. Yeah. You're not trying to build something that is in the process of being built. Yeah. I, the last thing I want to do is duplicate effort. And the easiest way to not duplicate effort is to get whatever you're doing in front of everyone. You need to make sure that everyone you're transparent and that everyone can see exactly what's going on. And, and chat ops is a great way to do that. Yeah. So at least for our stack, I think of that. Um, maybe not so much the deployments. 
uh, I think I added in there because it was very easy for develop from a development perspective. It's saying, you know, hey, I want to be able to create the environment for this so I can switch, you know, change out the image tag in the environment. And then I want to be able to full deploy on that. And then I want to be able to run composition role in case, you know, I do end up changing the tag or changing a feature within that tag. And then I want to be able to tear down the instance. And that's at least what I have for our stack. Yeah, that's, that's your life cycle. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's the development life cycle that I'm going through right now. And that's what it is. That's essentially what I've been walking through, which it makes it pretty nice. Um, makes it pretty easy. Uh, I do have like a little standalone matrix uh, chat that I just, just using for testing and implementation because of course, uh, you know, the uh, running, getting it set up uh, with matrix immediately, it was, you know, there's a, the Ruby SDK kind of, kind of, it's navigating into any new API. You just kind of got to walk through yeah. it to understand what's going on and what's happening. But what do you, what are your thoughts on, you could say the entire life cycle, our life cycle or chat ops in general, what you think of it. I, I can tell you right now, I don't use it at work. We just use a ticket system. We get paid, we get, I don't know if you want to call it chat ops, but I do get paged on critical and high tickets at work. I'll get like a, a phone page and I have it set up to, you know, really go off. But other than that, it's just an email notification saying, Hey, you've been assigned this ticket, you know, check it out in the ticketing system. I don't know if you want to even call that chat ops, but I don't know if you, what, what you thought on the matter. I'm really glad we had the conversation about webhooks and state earlier. Yeah. And a making API calls and, 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 why we would choose one or the other and, and, and the interplay between the two. Because I think I think the big takeaway from that conversation that we were going through was that what we needed to have and what we weren't constrained by was maintaining state. It, you know, it, being in being in portal, making the, the call outs to the, the run deck API, we weren't constrained by having straight. Right. We could we could dump something to a database, we could read that database anytime we wanted, right? This, the mentality that we need to approach this situation is very similar to that. In that, what needs to be in the chat is a type of API call. It's a type of alert. It, you know, right. it's, a, it's a type of interface. However, we need somewhere to maintain state. We don't have to live everywhere in cyberspace. We can have a community in in one kind of central place. You know, and and for us it's not a forum. For us it is a a chat room, right? For us it is a subreddit. Like that's that's where we've chosen to to centralize around. And if we're if we're going to keep keep that communication piece in in matrix then we're going to use that. Um, now I touched on the the three sections here and and for most of this we've been talking about the uh, communication back and forth between humans you know between jack and i you know just kind of chatting letting ourselves know about what's going on we've also been talking about notifications that we want to get notified out of we got a contact form and command center or if a build completes or camboard actually does have matrix integration so jack you may be starting to get messages if i set this up you may be starting to get messages. Taking a look at those, yeah. If yeah. if I start if I start giving your your code reviews uh, bad marks, you know, you, you, you're <laughs> oh, man. gonna get a heads up about those. I'm sure GitLab actually has a matrix integration too. So I mean, so they we, don't. They do not. They, they probably have a bridge. They probably have a bridge. They don't that we actually. The guy the guy was the guy that uh, actually wrote the Ruby SDK said he has a pull request out there because that's what I was looking at. I said, is there uh, already something out there? I can integrate with and they i think they support this, this is going to sound crazy i think they support uh you know major chat i think it's you know team slack um i don't know they, they don't matter they support Mattermost, i think which is another open source chat application that's out there they didn't support matrix and so i saw the guy i, I don't know who the i don't know the, his name but i saw the developer put in a pull request saying hey look, why can't we support matrix and i think he had an implementation it's a matter of making a put, like a put request to, you know, matrix.org. They haven't done it yet because I was really looking for that. I said, oh my gosh, if I could just have the, you know, if images build and they, I just send it rather than me having to, you know, home bake something in, if it's already a feature that's available, 
why would I not use that? Yeah, especially if it's a fe feature that's already available. But, you know, for me, a lot of what I do in Python is just kind of, all right, well, I can glue it together if it's not implemented. And I'm sure that's something that's you could I'd... come up with if, it's a, it was if a quick... we consider it to be valuable. Right. And it was a quick, so for me, it was a matter of a curl script. It was one line. It was curl, you know, put this. That's easy enough. Yeah. So, okay. So we got the back and forth. We got the, the notifications aspect to it. But we haven't talked about the actually taking action based on it, giving commands based on it. And, okay. yeah. and that's that's where your bot comes in because a lot of the things you're talking about, you made a curl script to post to that. Well, yeah, that will put a message into the chat, but I can't take any action on that, not unless I have something listening on the other end. So Matrix says the idea of widgets, and those are mainly web apps that you can access through through widgets but those wouldn't be like like anything that like i wouldn't put a run deck widget in there without some serious kind of refactoring to say hey i want to i want literally one button for this you know type of job or something like that and and what a a home baked chatbot is going to be is is probably something that'll allow us to to give a command and have it take its environment, and that's, Jack, why you said you were running into a lot of environment variables and, and throwing those around. Absolutely. And and then using using that authentication or details or whatever to run on behalf of the user that requested it what we need it to run. Now, there's a lot of overhead there that you could do with, like, authentication and, and security users, oh, yeah. any kind of security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we just having this tested in a closed, closed room, environment. Right? That's what it is, right? That's at this point, I just know it's you and me in that chat group plus the R Compose bot as a third user, which, you know, autonomous user, whatever. It's closed system. I know it's you and me. So the only one abusing it is quite literally going to be you and me, unless, of course, someone were to be added in the chat room, which is unlikely to occur considering it's a closed chat room impossible to occur yeah it's, it's just gonna be the two of us yeah yeah which is which is the security measure. well and there could be more but i mean right now that i'm not concerned about that what i'm concerned about is like the functionality like what are we setting this up to do we're trying to make it easy on ourselves to develop and, and push out the new things that that we're doing to try to make this a little bit easier and i think a lot of what i see this able to become is really a one-stop shop for us to to be hands-off for a lot of the the things that we otherwise would have had to really dig down deep and and, and use um, a lot of what i am juggling right now to do deploys and to do testing and stuff could be taken over by by something like this which would also be in the same place that i get all my updates for everything else on sorry so it's just it's just easy now the advanced part of this is when you start talking about like bots that have been written for slack or teams or stuff like that where you do have integrations that that push out some you got like RSS reader bots that will give you updates when, when stuff happens. Uh, there's just a lot you can do with with bots, but I think chat ops specifically is stuff that allows you to act and react. And we're not saying that, you know, we've we've coded up a pretty interface to this. Like I, I've seen, and Jack, I think you were with me. I, I, we were out to dinner after one of the open source club meetings we were we were talking to, to someone and he was pulling up his, his slack app and, and showing us how his incident response looked and he's like you want me to rebuild the uh the production scenes right now you want me to rebuild them all you know i was like I, he's like yeah i could just start kick off a rolling reboot right now and but not only that like it was it was a it was a healthy looking interface like it had buttons and options and drop downs and stuff like that and, and we're not there it, i i think i think Really, the core functionality is, is stuff that you've had since the IRC days. And a lot of the hosting companies that I've been a part of has, have had IRC support for a while. And one of the elementary commands is going to be bang uptime, 
right? So you can tell, you know, what what has your server gone down, right? Uh, especially if you have like different server names, if your 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 hosting provider has has different servers, and you know which one you're on, you can check the uptime, you can check the utilization in all in the the chat room and, and this is this is where it gets into some of the the authentication but like you have the administrators in the same chat that all of the clients are in too and 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 they're able to issue commands that the clients aren't able to you know you see the same thing in twitch you see the same thing in any kind of chat protocol right is is these bots running the commands on on behalf of the users now a lot of that is set up in in the case of the the broader ecosystems in a more general sense where you can it's almost plug and play at that point where you just need to specify you know what room you're in and it'll give you all the commands and you just got to pass it the api key or, or what have you so that that makes it a little bit easier but coding out something up from from scratch is is going to be necessary if you're you're running into the stuff that we are where you're actually building a platform to develop on or you're maintaining a platform that's that's home built um, so that's that's going to be a little bit more intensive uh, but it's also going to be beneficial in that we can tune it to exactly what we need it to do we have control over the code you know we will have our own instance running that's something that we can do uh, and in q2 i think we're going to be looking a lot into the how do we up our automation game and i think this is going to be a core component uh, of what we use here you know and, and a chatbot is is something super easy to to dockerize and make a connection to database and source state in there you know and, and whatnot and i think it it will in fact bring a lot of cohesity to to what we're doing what are you hoping with chat ops for me it's about the development life cycle and for me i think it's about transparency all right. Well, anything else on chat ops? Anything uh, burning? To... All right. I'll probably post up that uh, repo. I actually have it dockerized because uh, thank you, Ruby on Rails, for forcing me to learn how to dockerize Ruby apps and Rails apps. That w that took me all of about you know an hour, maybe, maybe not not even. That'll probably be out there. Hopefully not with our environment variables spilled everywhere. Don't worry, I get get ignored those ones. If I had to sum it up, I, I, I think, Jack, I would say that we're always looking for the next way to to become more productive, to kind of streamline our workflow, to to make things easier for us. Right. And, and you know, at, at our Compose, we we try to help groups and communities and individuals become more productive by using these sorts of open source technologies. So uh, to. To get started, go ahead and sign up for an instance of R Compose today at rcompose.com. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of R Compose Cast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.